Membrane pumps are transmembrane proteins that utilize energy to basically form electrochemical gradients. And then these electrochemical gradients are used by another category of membrane proteins we call membrane channels. So channels are these transmembrane proteins that use the same electrochemical gradient that is established by these pumps to actually move ions and molecules across the membrane down that electrochemical gradient. And what that means is membrane channels, unlike membrane pumps, do not actually use any energy. So we see that membrane pumps use energy to establish the electrochemical gradients, but then the membrane channels use those same electrochemical gradients to then move these ions and molecules spontaneously across that cell membrane without actually using any energy. And these membrane channels basically respond to chemical or sometimes physical changes in the environment around that particular channel. And that's exactly what stimulates the opening or the closing of that channel, as we'll discuss in just a moment. So we're going to focus on three different types of membrane channels. We're going to look at ligand uh, gated ion channels. We're going to look at voltage gated ion channels and also discuss gap junction. So in this lecture, I'd like to introduce these three different types of channels. And in the following lectures, we're actually going to focus on the details of each one of these channels. And let's begin with the ligand gated ion channel. Now, this is basically a channel, a transmembrane protein that allows the flow of different types of ions. So sometimes we have sodium, we can have potassium, we can have chloride, calcium. So basically these ions flow across the cell membrane from a high concentration to low concentration gradient and the opening of these channels is a result of the binding of some type of stimulatory molecule and this stimulatory molecule is known as a ligand so ligand gated ion channels are these channels that respond to the binding of a special type of molecule and once that molecule binds so let's say this green molecule is the ligand it binds onto the outer portion of this transmembrane protein we call a ligand gated ion channel once it binds let's say on the outside it causes a conformational change that opens up the internal pocket of that particular transmembrane protein and then some type of ion can flow across that membrane from one side to the other side in this case let's say it's from the outside to the inside of the cell so this is the sodium ion flowing in this direction now there are many examples of ligand gated ion channels inside our body and the one that we're going to take a look at in a future lecture is the acetylcholine receptor that we basically find on the postsynaptic membranes of cells found within the neuron pathway. So let's suppose this is the presynaptic neuron cell and this is the postsynaptic cell. This is the membrane of the postsynaptic cell. So along the membrane, we have many of these ligand gated ion channels we call acetylcholine receptors and they're essentially closed. Now, because they're closed, the sodium ions, which are found at a higher concentration on the outside of the cell, cannot move into the cell. But what happens is, when an action potential basically reaches this section of the neuron, it stimulates these vesicles to be released to this environment. And once these vesicles are released via exocytosis, they release these neurotransmitters we call acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is the ligand that binds onto these ligand gated ion channels which open up and then allow the spontaneous movement of these sodium ions from the outside into the inside of that cell and that can create another action potential or it can make a muscle contract or do many other things as we'll discuss in a future lecture now let's move on to voltage gated ion channels so we essentially see that these ligand gated ion channels respond to the binding of special types of stimulating molecules 
In this particular case, these transmembrane proteins, which also allow the movement of these ions across the cell and membrane, respond to a change in the electric potential difference between the two sides of the membrane. So in a change of the membrane voltage. So let's suppose this is some particular voltage gated ion channel. For instance, one voltage gated ion channel that we're going to focus on in detail is the sodium voltage gated ion channel. And this voltage gated ion channel exists across the axon membrane of neurons and it plays a very important part in actually generating and propagating action potentials along the axon of that neuron. So this is our sodium voltage gated ion channel and let's suppose when we're at the resting membrane potential, so a voltage difference of about negative 60 millivolts, this channel is closed. Now, as a result of the action of these ligand gated ion channels, this, uh, there, th there might be a change in the membrane voltage, as we'll discuss in a future lecture. And so this might become less positive, uh, less negative. Let's say it, uh, it decreases or it increases to about negative 40 millivolts. Now, when this change takes place, as a result of that change in the membrane voltage, the electric potential difference between the two sides of the cell, what happens is this opens up and once it opens up, it allows the movement of the sodium ions down their electrochemical gradient from this, from the outside to this side to the inside. And again, we'll study the specifics of these types of voltage gate ion channels in a lecture to come. Now, let's focus on gap junctions. So, what are gap junctions? Well, in the case of ligand gated ion channels and the voltage gated ion channels, the actual spaces between the two sides of the membrane within the protein, so this space here and this space here, it's actually relatively small. But for gap junctions, these are relatively wide channels. And these relatively wide channels basically exist between closely packed cells. So let's say, <coughs> let's say this is the cell membrane of one cell, this is the cell membrane of a closely packed adjacent cell, and this is our gap junction. So it basically transverses these two cell membranes. And what it ultimately does is it allows the movement of not only small ions, but also relatively large polar molecules, for instance, sugar molecules, so monosaccharides, things like glucose. It allows the movement of amino acids. It allows the movement of nucleotides and so forth. And so there are four important functions of gap junction. So they function in number one, intercellular communication, number two, in cell nourishment. So for instance, those cells of our body, which are not found in close proximity to capillaries, cannot receive the food from the capillaries. And so things like glucose and amino acids are received as a result of these gap junctions. Number three, movement of the action potential. So for instance, in very excitable cells of our body, for instance, cardiac muscle cells, cardiac muscle cells actually use gap junctions to propagate the electron, the action potential across the entire heart. And what that does is it creates a continuous and a forceful contraction that allows the movement of the blood through the cardiovascular system of the body. And finally, these gap junctions, as we'll see, are also involved in development and differentiation. So we see that we have not only membrane pumps that actually utilize ATP molecules and other energy sources to generate these electrical potentials, electro electrochemical potentials, but we also have these membrane channels that utilize those established electrochemical gradients to actually move these ions and molecules across the two sides of the membranes found inside our cells.